We're lucky to have Marco De Leon here. Uh, he's a co-founder and co-CEO of Rip Van Waffles, which is a local company bringing the uh, Belgian Stroop waffle to America. Please welcome Marco De Leon. Okay, can you, can you guys hear me now? Okay, um, great, yeah, as, uh, as he mentioned, I'm Marco De Leon, I'm the co-founder of Rip Van Waffles. Um, and so what we have, uh, what we prepared is just a few uh, guiding questions just about the story of the brand, um, why we started the company, um, some of the challenges that we faced along the way, um, where we're going, and then you know, happy to, to open things up to, uh, to questions. So, uh, when did uh, when did I want to start a company? Um, so my my first business was selling uh, books on eBay. So I started a business I think when I was eight or so. Um, I would buy them from my school because they would sell them for ninety nine cents, um, and we could actually sell them. I could sell them on eBay for I think twelve dollars. So I was really happy with that. Uh, that was my first business, and after that, you know, I started a number of other businesses, whether it was washing, uh, washing cars or, you know, any number of other, other things. And so I was uh, always very entrepreneurial, um, always loved, uh, loved the idea of starting my own business. And really, when I got to, to college, um, one of the things that uh, I was thinking a lot about was, you know, what is an entrepreneurial venture that, that I could start? And really the only people that were coming to uh, our university were investment banks to, to hire. So that was kind of like, well, maybe I'll wait to do the entrepreneurial venture. Maybe I'll do uh, finance instead. And so my junior year of college, um, I studied in Rio. And I think it was somewhere along the lines of the you know, f four or five days on the beach, I realized, you know what, I don't really want to do uh, finance. Um, anymore, and I wanted to uh, start the business. Start the business immediately. Um, I went to uh, went to Brown undergrad. I did an internship at Morgan Stanley, and when I came back, uh, really, what I was really looking for was what was what kind of business could could I start? And I ran into my friend um, who now goes by by Rip. Um, his original name is is Abishek, and. We were good friends. We, uh, he's from Amsterdam, and so he grew up having uh, a stroopwafel um, in Holland growing up. He would bring them back uh, to our dorm room. And so he would bring a full suitcase of waffles um, and, I don't know, probably 50 or 60 in a suitcase, and they would be gone within a week. And so he said, you know, hey, there might be something here. And so one winter he brought back uh, a waffle iron. And so with that waffle iron, we looked up some recipes on Google, and we just started making them by hand. And so this is a picture of us um, on the main green um, at Brown. Um, you can see the little waffle iron there. Um, and basically, we were you know, selling, them, uh, selling them one by one um, to, uh, to different students as they, would, as they would pass by. And so that was my senior year of college. And you know, one of the things that, that we started doing at, at Brown was we said, OK, let's try to sell this um, at the retail location. So we had this really small operation where um, someone gave us free, uh, free space to, to make our product. And so we had, instead of one wall fire, and we bought another wall fire, and we had, I think we had three um, at our peak um, at that point. Um, and we had some employees making them by hand, hand sealing them in the morning, and so we would wake up at four or five a.m. in the morning, um, deliver them in the morning to, uh, to the campus retail locations, and we would sell them like that. And you know, what we saw was that you know, students really loved the product. And so you know, we were at Brown's, I think it was the Blue Room, we were the fourth best-selling product, and we basically said, hey, there's, there's something here. 
Um, we think that the data shows us that there's a, there's a, a good path to uh, actually starting this business, and let's see where it can go. And so, kind of how we viewed the, the brand initially was, you know, we were, as you can see in the data, we were being beat by, by Chobani in, in sales, but it was, uh, wasn't too far away. And so we were looking at it as, you know, where Chobani brought this Greek product, a uh, European-inspired product, to, to the U.S., we could do the same with this Dutch, Dutch product. Um, and essentially what we, were, what we were thinking of was we could take this product that exists in, in Europe, and worldwide it was over a billion uh, units a year, and it didn't exist in the U.S. at all. And so we said, we could take this to, to the U.S., um, we could make the product a lot healthier, and we could decrease the amount of sugar, we could um, use a lot higher quality ingredients, and we could uh, create a business like that. And so that's, that's how we started. And um, that brings us to where, where we are today. Basically, you know, the way that we position ourselves is a crispy and chewy treat um, without the guilt. So it's eight grams of sugar, um, non-GMO project verified. So it's, it's a treat um, for sure. And so we, we compete in that category. We're not saying that this is a health bar. We're not saying that it's an energy bar. Um, if, you, you know, if you're in a grocery store, it's in the cookie aisle. Um, but we've tried to make it a lot healthier and we think we've succeeded at, at doing that. And so what were some of the major challenges? Um, we've had a ton of challenges and I'm happy to uh, answer any other questions about, about these as well. But this initially was our, our go-to-market strategy. We had a, a beat up uh, Volvo station wagon, uh, had a crack in the front windshield that we couldn't afford to uh, repair. And we would load the product up. This is my senior year of college. We would load the product up in the back of the car um, to, uh, to try to sell it door to door. Um, and so we went basically from Brown. We went to cafes around the uh, Providence area. We s sold at RISD. And then we expanded to other universities around the Northeast, all going door to door ourselves, me and my partner, um, while we were trying not to uh, fail out of school, which was um, you know, we got very, very lucky because we had some kind professors who uh, felt sorry for us, I think. Um, and so this was how we, how we started. I mean, we struggled for a couple of years really trying to get just a little bit of traction. Our first order from our contract manufacturer, I think we ordered 20,000 waffles, and we sold through half of them. And then the rest, the remainder of them uh, when, uh, when, when were spoiled. So that was uh, that was a, you know lesson in uh, in demand planning a bit, a lesson in sales, and so we learned a lot of those lessons along the way, um, and this was how we we went about the business for the first couple of years. When we graduated school, um, we then moved out to San Francisco, and in San Francisco, uh, some of our first accounts that we launched there were a lot of tech companies. So we realized that hey, one of the ways that we could build our initial business was we could supply these tech companies that give out products for free to their employees. And by doing that, we could fund the rest of our business. And so we started doing that, you know, really grinding it out. I mean, we would be in, in uh, again, going door to door ourselves. We didn't really have a team. At this point, we hadn't raised any money at all, so we had no money. And so it was just me and my partner going door to door trying to build the, trying to build the brand. And eventually, we reached a point where it clicked. And that was about probably two, two years ago or so. Basically, we had built up you know, a really strong data story, not only in the alternative distribution that we had built in the uh, you know, tech company community and kind of the OCS vending market, but that translated into uh, natural um, and specialty velocity data that was really strong in, uh, in the Bay Area. And so what we did was we leveraged that to get a meeting with Starbucks. And uh, once we're in the meeting with Starbucks, we uh, show them the data. We show them, hey, this is how it sells. Um, and now we sell in over 12,000 Starbucks um, across the US and uh, in Canada. Um, so from there, you know, basically, what the, the long and short of this is, is we've struggled, uh, I would say, up until, up until today. We still struggle through a, lot of, a number of different things. But basically, we bootstrapped you know, the entire business built it up through, through, uh, through cash flow, using a little bit of money, um, going door to door, 
um, trying to get people to you know, try the product, try to get retailers to, to jump on board with the product, and uh, we're, we're excited about the next steps. And so what we've done here uh, recently this year, we just set up our own production facility. Um, so we invested about $2 million in a production facility in the US. Um, we had been using a co-packer um, in Canada up until, up until now, so we now have our own production facility distribute across the, uh, the US and Canada. And now really our focus is building out uh, retail landscape. So up until now, we've basically just built up a you know, strong data set, essentially, built up the brand recognition. And now we're really focusing on building out retail um, in certain regions of the, uh, of the US. So basically, we didn't touch that um, for the first four years of the business. We didn't touch you know, the conventional grocery chains we didn't touch a lot of, you know, even the Whole Foods regions, um, because the idea that what we wanted to do was have, you know, winning strategies, winning data in all these different retailers, and then move on to the next retailers when we had uh, the right uh, the right story to tell. And so, uh, with that, that's kind of a short background about the uh, about the brand. Um, happy to answer any questions that uh, that anyone has. What's next? Yeah. What's next? So we're, uh, if, you, if we look at the, uh, the, first, the first slide, I think one of the first things that we're, we're doing, uh, that we're working on right now is we're actually going through a rebranding and where we're allowing ourselves to enter into other, other categories, creating more of a platform for the brand. So that's one, that's one thing. Um, and then the second thing is that we're launching a you know, number of different uh, flavor extensions as well so that we can really build an incredibly strong core flavor set that can compete in, uh, in mass market. Um, so those are the first two things that we're doing with the product. And as I mentioned, with the, with the distribution, essentially what we have now is we have this you know, launching pad with, with Starbucks. We have you know, this launching pad with all this uh, you know, tech distribution. And that gives us the opportunity now to move into you know, grocery and really penetrate natural in a bigger way as well. You said a lot of the uh, headaches haven't gone away. So what's your biggest challenge day to day? Uh, right now, it's really uh, building out the right team. So, you know, we've spent a lot of time, um, you know, getting advice from, from smart, smart operators who have done it before. And what we're really focused on now is building out the different components of the core team, whether it's building out sales team and the field sales team underneath them to, again, you know, support a broker network, um, build out merchandising in store. Um, that's really a big focus for us right now, and I would say the biggest, the biggest challenge or you know, thing that uh, we're working to you know, improve day to day. How many of you are there now, and how many would you like there to be as you build out? Uh, so we have uh, nine in our headquarters here in, in, uh, in New York, and then we have uh, 24 in production um, Okay. at the production facility. Yeah. All right. Um, you and your partner are co-founders. I, I want to see how many co-founders we have in the in the room how many people are working with someone else so how do you guys manage that on a day-to-day -day basis how do you divide up responsibilities how often do you slug it out behind the warehouse yeah so so we uh i don't think we've had any uh any arguments for a few years now um we uh we we, we went through went through all of those in the first couple of years uh but we, we basically split up responsibilities um, like this. So he does a lot of the sales and, uh, and marketing. So anything that's, any big sales meeting, even if it's, you know, w even if our director of sales is taking, if it's an initial meeting, um, he'll be there and he'll be the face of the, the brand in that way. Um, in the same way, you know, he oversees our, our sales team as well um, and also marketing. And then operations, finance, uh, recruiting, um, report into me. And so I'm, you know, if we're negotiating something with, with a manufacturing facility 
or we're doing some sort of legal negotiation or we're raising a round of funding, um, that's something that, that I'm doing. So we basically kind of split it in that way and it, it really plays to our strengths and that's kind of how we've, we've made minor changes along the way of how we split responsibilities, but it ultimately comes down to, you know, what are we each good at, what are we each bad at, and how can we position ourselves so that we're playing to our strengths as much as possible and then, you know, filling in the weaknesses as well as we're, as we're building the team. Um, and I want to see what your experience has been like with brokers. With what? Brokers. With brokers. Um, it's been mixed. I mean, I think the, the best advice that we, that we got very early on, and I think we learned this the, the hard way. I think one of the things that we, we learned about distributors in general was that we thought, oh, great, we got, I think UNFI was actually our first distributor. So the story of how we got into UNFI was we were my senior year of college. Um, we have the product. We, do, we don't even have a production facility yet um, where we're producing it. Um, the shelf life's maybe five days. We go down to UNFI. We sweet talk the receptionist and say, hey, you know, we're just starting. We're college students. Can we get a meeting? The next week, we have a meeting with the VP, and, uh, and we're slotted into UNFI in, in, I think, three or four of their DCs in the Northeast. And basically, we had no way to produce the product. We had no sales team. And uh, we were basically, uh, uh, we didn't know what to do. And we thought, well, we got the distribution. It's, everything's going to be great. And we just had products sitting in the warehouse. We got billed back for it. And it ended up hurting us really badly. And so what we learned in that was that, you know, these, while distribution is great, while signing on a broker is great, ultimately you have to sell the product. And if you don't have the resources to put behind four DCs, go into one DC and win in that DC. Show the movement, um, get the sales force that you have, build your sales team, show the movement in that one DC, show success, then when you're ready, launch another DC. Again, show success and you build on that success instead of spreading yourself thin um, without the resources to, uh, to sell. So I would say, as it relates to your question about brokers, um, you know, we had a similar, similar thing where you ultimately can't rely on anyone to do the job of the brand. And the brand needs to pioneer itself. The, the founders of the brand are ultimately the best salespeople for the brand. And uh, I think that's something that, that uh, sometimes people forget. And you guys are also in that transitional moment where you're going to have a point where there are going to be people representing the brand who aren't necessarily you or Rip. And yeah. how are you guys prepping for that? Yeah, I think the, the big thing is, is having, having good systems and, so, and having good people and good systems, right? So, you know, one of the things that we've really focused on from a recruiting standpoint is bringing on people from organizations that we really respect or, or you know, from people who we know have built great sales organizations as well. So the people that you're bringing on know how to pioneer, know how to pioneer a brand. They know, they've been in those kind of meetings. They understand, you know, here's what the brand is about and here's how I can convey that to a buyer. And I think having that kind of skill set is, is invaluable. Um, and so looking for, for, you know, when you're recruiting, bringing on people who've done it before um, is really helpful in that way and it makes, you know, makes life a lot easier for, for us as founders because we don't have to have so much you know, day to day control in that, in that regard. All right, well listen, good luck as you guys scale and move into all these great new channels. Thanks. Well, thank you, thank you guys. <laughs>